Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. In preaching this series, and um, this is actually not the last part of it. Um, if you were to look, and if you're there in Ephesians 6, I'm in Galatians 6. And you pray for me this morning. There's a lot of hindrance on me this morning. A lot of hindrance. Uh, I don't feel comfortable preaching. I don't feel, I don't know how to describe it. Sometimes you will, sometimes your spirit will detect things uh, before your mind or your heart knows what's going on. Uh, and I've had that happen many times, but I, I do feel a, a, a hindrance this morning. Um, so I cannot, what I can't do is I can't promise you I'm going to give you my very best message in the whole world this morning. What I can promise you is I will give you the Word of God. And I will let the Word of God do what I am incapable of doing this morning. Uh, Wednesday night, I don't know if you were watching Wednesday night, but man, I was fired up. And it just felt, it felt different preaching Wednesday night. This morning, I can, I can just, I can feel a, a hindrance. Um, I don't know how else to say it other than that. Um, but in this list of the whole armor of God that he gives us, uh, in verse 17, the helmet of salvation, we talked about that. The last thing he says in verse 17 is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But he's not done, in my opinion, with the armor of God. It ends, I believe, in verse 18, with praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. That's the life of prayer that we lead. And so... Um, when I'm done preaching on the sword of the Spirit, may be done today, I don't know. May, I may preach part of it today, part of it tonight, or part of it next Sunday morning, I don't know yet. But after that, I'm going to begin a series on biblical prayer. What it is, what it is not. And uh, God taught me about prayer several years ago with a situation Actually, several. It's been a, been a series of situations that have happened in my life where God forced me to my knees and forced me to pray, to cry out to Him. Now, what I'm not going to do in that series is give you magic words to say that when you say them, God, it invokes God instantly and He immediately shows up and, and that's how it works. That's witchcraft. And I might even explain the difference in biblical prayer and witchcraft. What witches do in a ceremony is a form of prayer, and it, but it's a prayer to the universe. It's a prayer to whatever the spirits. And um, if we're not careful, the influences and the things that you listen to, whether it's on supposed Christian radio or it's things that you see on Facebook. In fact, let me give you an example. On Facebook, somebody will put up there and they'll say, if you believe in Jesus, send this to 100 of your friends. And if you don't send this to 100 of your friends, obviously you don't believe in Jesus. That's stupid. That's baloney. It has nothing to do with real Bible Christianity. Or it says... Uh, pray for my cousin so-and-so. God has told me if we can get a thousand people praying for my cousin, God will heal him and he won't die. That's also a lie. The Bible never says that. What does the Bible say? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. One man. One man praying or one woman praying can bring God down, can bring healing on somebody, can change an entire nation. Elijah prayed one time 
It didn't rain for three and a half years, and that affected the entire nation of Israel. That kind of stuff is what I'm talking about. But that's not the message for today. But I, I probably, if God may throw something uh, in the mix between here and there, but when I get to it, but I'm going to, I'm going to preach or teach a series on biblical prayer. I'm going to teach you some of the very simple things that God has taught me. And they are simple things. I don't believe in complicated Christianity. And the Bible teaches against it. Now, Ephesians chapter 6. Here's probably why I'm struggling this morning. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It, I'm not fighting my body this morning. I feel pretty good this morning. I think my blood pressure is doing in good shape. I think my blood sugar is about right. My back doesn't hurt. My head doesn't hurt. I'm not coughing. I don't have a cold. I don't have any body aches, chills, loss of taste and smell. Thank God. I don't have, I don't have anything going on in my physical body that is preventing me from preaching this the way I think I want to preach it or try to preach it or whatever. There is definitely something in the spiritual realm that my flesh cannot detect, it cannot see it, it cannot hear it, cannot smell it, cannot taste it, cannot touch it. It cannot be affected or restrained by my flesh, but I am wrestling against it nonetheless. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Here's what we wrestle against. Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And that may be one that I'm wrestling against this morning. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now let me ask you a question. Do devils come to church? Absolutely. They will work during the service to hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. They will work in a service to hinder the hearing and thus the believing of the Word of God. How is it we're saved? For it is by grace are you saved through faith. How does faith come? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And in practically every church service, every time two or more are gathered together in His name, we know that we have the presence of Jesus Christ here in our midst, at least if no, in no other form than in the form of this book right here. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Is this what you believe? Okay? Then we ask for God's Spirit, which is also the Spirit. Notice that he said that we're, we're to take, verse 17, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the what? Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let me make this real simple for you. I can make this real simple in two minutes and turn you loose. Let you beat Second Baptist and First Baptist to all the good restaurants. You want the Holy Ghost around? Get this book open and start reading and believing it. The Holy Ghost will show up. He promised He would. The Holy Ghost. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That inspiration has the word spirit in it, which is the Spirit of God. When you read and when you believe this book, the Holy Ghost is right there with you, helping you read. Helping you, and then all of a sudden your mind will shoot off in some place else. Oh, I gotta do this. I forgot I left this on. Or oh, I gotta do something else, right? That's not the Holy Spirit, is it? That's a principality, or that's a power, or that's a ruler of the darkness of this world, or that's a spiritual wickedness in high places. It's one, or it's all four of them ganged up to get your mind out of this word. You would be, you probably wouldn't be surprised 
after I preached this last Sunday about making myself a personal habit of coming in here in the morning and setting aside time to read the Bible, Monday and Tuesday was the most chaotic days I think I've had in weeks. It took me till past noon to get to my Bible. And my intention was to get to it by 9.30. And it was just one thing after another. The devil will try every trick he's got in the book to keep your mind, your heart, and your eyes, and your ears away from this book. So we're wrestling. It's not flesh and blood. You say, well, I can't read very good. You can hear it. And if you can hear it, I've got CDs for you. I'll give you the entire Word of God on CD. You can listen to it. Brother Sterling, in his pickup truck, you turn his truck on, you know what you'll hear? Alexander Scorby reading the King James Bible. That's all you'll hear in there. So this is what we're fighting against. This is what we're wrestling against. Verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be, may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. When I asked a while ago for you to raise your hand if you need prayer this morning, it is highly possible that you are either today, right now, dealing with an evil day, or you are going to deal with it this week, and you know something's coming, and you don't think you're going to make it. So God, the Spirit, is working and in contact with your spirit, giving you this sense, man, I need to be praying. Man, I need to be reading my Bible. I need prayer. I need somebody praying for me. I need to pray. Because what I'm dealing with right now in my life, I, I'm not making it very well on my own. And I need help. I need help from heaven. That is probably what is going on with at least one person in this building, if not probably all of us. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore. Having your loins good about with truth. We talked about that. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. We talked about that. Having your feet shod the preparation of gospel and peace. We talked about that. Above all, taking the shield of faith. We preached on that. Several messages wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Then verse 17, take on the helmet of salvation. I preached on salvation a couple Sundays ago. Last Sunday, I preached on being a servant and having a servant's attitude, being a good steward of God, being and, and making sacrifices. Making sacrifices. Sacrificing of time. Sacrificing of efforts. Sacrificing of give, yielding, yielding over what is yours to God. I've done that multiple times. He said, take the helmet of salvation. And then he said, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And do not, do not let social media, Facebook, YouTube, your next door neighbor, your friends, the people you work with, tell you this nonsense that the Holy Ghost, you get baptized in the Holy Ghost sometime after you get salvation. Don't let them tell you that nonsense. If you don't have God's Spirit dwelling in you, you're not saved to begin with. That's baloney. That's garbage. That's, I don't know who invented that doctrine. I don't know who came up with that. I don't know where that, what hole, what pit that came out of. But they did, that did not come out of the Bible. If you are saved, you have the indwelling Spirit of God's Son in you crying, Abba, Father. God is no longer your enemy or somebody you're running from. He is the Father that you're running towards. Somebody say amen. That's the Spirit of God in you. The Spirit of God's Son dwelling in you crying, Abba, Father. Where, by the way, where does Jesus live right now in our bodies? In relation to our bodies, where does He live right now? Our hearts, does He not? Where is it that the Bible is right now in relation to our bodies? Thy word have I hid? Same place. Imagine that. 
So you know what I'm, you already know what I'm going to say to you. When it comes to Jesus Christ, when it comes to God the Father, when it comes to the Holy Ghost, these three are one. And if you want them in your presence, open the book. Because there they are. The Bible describes the Bible, the Word of God, in this, it describes it in many, many ways. It is the foundation stone. Um, it's a fire, it's a consuming fire. The Bible describes the Bible in multitude of different ways. But here he's describing it as a sword. Let's, did we pray yet? Let's pray. Father, help me preach today. Help these people listen. Father, I know there's devils in here. I know there is. And I pray, dear God, that you'd make them sit down, bind them up, make them sit down, shut up, duct tape their mouth, make them go sit outside, cast them in the pit. I don't care what you do with them. Get, get rid of them. And let us have church in this building today. Let all these people that have joined with us online, these people that are home because they're sick, these people that could not make it today, these people that live a thousand miles away, Father, they, they're here today because they need to hear the Word of God. Father, keep the computer running. Don't let the flames of hell burn the computer up. And Father, we just pray, dear God, that you'd bless the message. And help me to preach it or teach it today, whatever, however you want it, God, it's up to you. But I'm asking you to bless your word today. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The only thing I know how to do today is just give you scripture. So I'm going to give you scripture. And if, if I were you, I would, write, I would write this down. You're going to need this. I pr listen, I promise you, you're going to need this one. Promise you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning because I already know the answer. But my question is this morning, do you still struggle with sin? Now don't raise your hand, don't nod your head. Don't stand up and start confessing. Please, don't start confessing. But you still deal with it. Whether it is lust of the eyes, whether it is lust of the flesh, or it is the pride of life, you still fight it daily. Everybody here does. So if you're, if you're sitting here today and you think, man, man, this church, if they knew me, they'd know I'd be I'm the worst sinner in this whole church. No, you're not. You're just the same as the worst sinner in this church. Because how, many, how much sin does it take? Just one. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. So Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now here's what, here's what we all started doing when we realized that they were stealing the election. We went out and bought a bunch of ammo. Didn't we? Bought a bunch of ammo, bought a bunch of guns. Man, there's fixing to be a war. Oh, it's going to get bad, and we're going to need this ammo, we're going to need these guns. A lot of people did that. Very few people read their Bible. Very few people read their Bible. And I'm going to ask you a question, and again, I don't, I don't want to see your hand, I don't want you to nod your head, I do not want you to indicate in any way how guilty you are. Have, how much Bible have you read this last week? Or how little... How little of your Bible have you read? How much time have you spent meditating on God's Word? How much time have you spent studying God's Word? How much time have you spent reading God's Word? And or hearing, listening to God's Word? This past week. How much time will you spend this week? You don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. But let me tell you what this Bible is trying to tell you. 
Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You cannot kill devils with bullets, guns, atomic bombs, grenades, and crucifixes. Did you hear what I just said? You cannot hold up a, a crucifix and say, Be gone, devil! He'll laugh at that because he knows it's nothing but an idol. And devils love idols. So whatever Hollywood, whatever idea and image Hollywood has planted in your mind, it does not work that way. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What I probably should have taught you this morning was what strongholds were. Maybe I'll do that next Sunday. Teach you what strongholds are. Casting down. What does verse 5 say? Casting down. What's that next word? Imagination. So let's, let's stop here for a minute. Let's spend some time with this. Let's just take our time. Since I'm not going to try to get in a hurry to preach all 150 verses that I've got here for you. Every sin and every form of sin... Every form of sin always begins in the imagination. Always. So let's try this out. So the devil shows up in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. He shows up in the Garden of Eden. And he says what he says to Eve about he's, comp he's counteracting God's commandment. To not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once he's removed that barrier in Eve's mind, immediately what did she do? Let's look at it. Turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. Now hold your place there in 2 Corinthians 10. Put your little Bible marker there, whatever it is you have. and Hold that place there. Because we're going to come back to it. Genesis chapter 3. You know what this is called? Bible study. We're not, I'm not preaching so much. I'm not walking up and down the stage and waving my hands and yelling and screaming at the top of my voice. We're studying the Bible. Verse 6. The first thing. Here's what you see. When the woman saw... Now what did she do? She turned her attention toward the tree. Now, how is it that you see something that tastes good? Do you, do you smear it on your eyes? Boy, that tastes, oh yeah, that tastes good. You look at it. And the years of our life of conditioning and looking at things and knowing what certain things taste like, our imagination invents a thing that makes our... T it's like Pavlov's dogs. Our mouth starts watering immediately. But it goes right to the imagination part of your brain, which is on the right hemisphere of your brain. You can look at something... A, a, a dinner plate with food on it, a cooking show, a, a hamburger commercial. You can look at that. I watched, Gary, I watched the documentary on the History Channel at 11 o'clock one night on the history of the American hamburger. And by midnight, I was starving to death for a hamburger. And there was no hamburger smell in my house. There was nobody cooking burgers in my house. It was all... Through my eyes, go into my imagination, wasn't it? And the Hardee's. Because Hardee's had commercials during that show. I'm telling you, Hardee's had commercials, and so did Burger King. They knew what to sponsor. Remember cigarette ads? They used to make it look cool. Was it cool? 
so that it works to the imagination. You see things, let's just say food. You see food, boy, that looks good. But see, it doesn't stop there, though, does it? Sometimes we see a person, a man or a woman, and we say, boy, that looks good. Just like they were food. And our imagination automatically, just like with food, our mind is imagining what that food would taste like. Our mind is imagining what having an affair with that person would be like. That's how it works. That's what, that's what got probably most, most of us in trouble at one time of our life or another is that we looked at somebody that we probably shouldn't have looked at and our imagination took over and said boy that would probably be nice to be with that's lust of the eyes lust of the flesh when the woman saw that the tree was good for food lust of the flesh she didn't taste it. She saw it with her eyes. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. That's still the imagination. Eye candy. It's pretty. It's nice looking. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. What happens? What, what, what turns you on to your first cigarette? Some cool kid in your neighborhood or some cool guy that you knew or some cool gal that you knew smoked and you thought it looked cool or it looked good and you stuck that cigarette in your mouth for the first time and then what did you do right after that? <laughs> it wasn't what you thought it would be, was it? And that's every sin. The tree to desire to be make, make one wise still goes to the imagination. We imagine ourselves being wiser and smarter and above everybody else in the world. We imagine ourselves on the top. We imagine ourselves winning all the arguments against our husband or against our wife. We imagine us climbing the ladder at work. We imagine ourselves being above everybody else. It's all done in the imagination. And what does God say? Now go back to it. What did I tell you? 2 Corinthians 10. Now go back to that. 2 Corinthians 10. Casting down imaginations. Why? Because they are what lead you to sin. If you look at something and it does not look good to you, You'll never touch it, will you? Here, I've got a plate of rocks. I just cooked them today. You look at them and go, that, that, see, that does not appeal to me. So it all works in the imagination. And God said to be cast them down. Get rid of them. Now you've got a weapon. And see, there's a devil for each one of those. Tied in with this. There's a devil to bring you that imagination. Do you believe the devil has the ability to put stuff in your head? I do! Because I've heard him talk. I've heard him tell me things. I've heard him say things. Casting down imagination. He never, watch this, he never talks to the part of my brain that would say, no, that's against God's commandments. He never talks to that part of my brain. He talks to my imagination, builds a picture for me of what this, how this is going to feel or how this is going to taste or how this is going to make me look to everybody. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is everything that you know in this book. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having it a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You see, when you get saved, 
when you get saved or when you repent and get right with God, the first thing you want to do is go kill the devil. Amen. I want to kill him. He brought this into my life. I hate him. And I hate all the devils that are with him. So this is, this is our weapon. This Bible. Out of all the things that we've got on the armor of God. The helmet of salvation. The breastplate of righteousness. Loins girded about with truth. Feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then all of that stuff is all. Watch this now. It's in case. The shield of faith. It's in case the devil strikes at us first. There is a way to keep him from striking at you first. It's called a sword of the Spirit. And I forgot I was going to do this today. I was going to bring my AR and put it on, strap it to me. I would have emptied it. Because knowing me, I would have shot a hole in the roof. But I would say, if you're a thief and I'm walking around town with an AR strapped to my shoulder, are you going to try to rob me or my family? David Cherney, can I get you to stand up for a second? You feel like standing up? Everybody turn around and look at David Cherney. Does that look like somebody you want to rob? Does it? Roy's showing off his. We, he's still got the bullet in his pocket, though. I check it every time I say hi to him. Yeah. Now watch this. For the Word of God is quick. As Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So you have a better weapon than all your enemies have, don't you? Even though, it, even though this itself is a sharp two-edged sword, this Bible is sharper than all the weapons that your enemy has against you. You can automatically win this war very quickly. Let me just, let me just lay something out for you, okay? Uh, and I honestly do not know of any single person, either here or online, that is going through this right now. But let me just lay out a scenario for you. Let's just say that somebody watching this service right now is contemplating getting into an adulterous situation with somebody. Let's just say that. I don't, again... I don't know of anybody here and I don't know of anybody online. But let's just say that somebody that's watching right now, that's in their mind. It's been in their mind. Okay? Who put it there? The devil put it there. Now, it's already in their flesh, right? But the devil brought the person into their life. Maybe it's somebody they work with. Maybe it's somebody they see at the store. Maybe it's somebody they go to church with. Maybe it's somebody, next door neighbor, who, who knows. It's just somebody, they've seen them, they've met them. And the, the devil wants them to commit fornication, commit adultery. You know it's wrong. You know it's wrong. But knowing it's wrong doesn't stop you from committing adultery. Does it? Does knowing adultery is wrong, does that ever... Does knowing the speed limit's 55 make you go 54? Speed limit signs don't slow people down. Only their will to do right can slow them down. So let's say that somebody's just being tempted to have an affair, commit fornication, whatever it is. 
They want to do it. They are fighting it off, but they're not winning. And it's because the devils that want them to do this will not let them will not let them go. They just keep keep prodding them, keep provoking them, keep bringing the situation on. Okay? The word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to divide, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of marrow. And watch this, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible knows that you want to commit adultery, doesn't it? The Bible knows. So what will happen is, the reason why you won't read the Bible is why. Why? Tell me why. Because it will know what's in your mind. And what you're thinking about doing. Preacher told me, I was preaching revival for him. Preacher told me he had a guy in his church. He said he just, he, he came to him and confessed. He got into an affair with somebody. He said, preacher, before I knew it, it just happened. And I said, I don't believe that. I told the preacher, I said, I don't believe that. He said, what do you mean? I said, a guy doesn't just wake up one day and find a woman and go sleep with him. A married guy, he's got to work. He's, that's got to work on him for a long time. It's got to vex him. Are you listening? It's got to vex him. It's got to claw at him and tear at him and chip away at his resolve until finally he runs out on his wife and goes after another one. But he doesn't just wake up one day and meet some woman and all of a sudden they're in bed together. That doesn't just happen that way. The devils bring about and they just keep working they keep provoking and they keep shoving and pushing and they won't stop they won't stop until they are made to stop now revelation 1 i turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned i saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle and his head and his hair were like fine wool or like wool and white as snow and his eyes were as flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword so it's, we're talking about the Bible and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength Second, thes I, let me skip some of this so we know the Bible's the sharp sword right? we know that that's what this is setting up. Out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword that he should smite the nations. Now watch this. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis, back to Genesis chapter 3. Back to Genesis chapter 3. The reason why I had David stand up was this reason right here. Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to read verse 22. So I want you to have your Bible open it because I don't have verse 22 and 23 up on the screen. Verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know, and to, to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. God did not want man to come near the tree of life anymore, did he? So, did God put a fence around it? Did he pull up the tree of life and stick it up like on Mars somewhere or Jupiter where we can't get to it? He left it right where it was. And in verse 24, so he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turns every way to keep the way of the tree of life. What was the sword there for? Huh? David's carrying this big sidearm. It looks, it looks like it's stuck out this far. To me, it would look like he would need both hands to pull it out. It's a cannon. Somebody that sees that knows, I ain't touching that guy. The purpose of having your sword is so that you never have to use it. Because your devils are not stupid. They're not stupid. They know 
God's sword when they see it. And they know to not approach or they will get cut and destroyed by that sword. Doesn't that make sense? So if I walked around with a great big firearm by my side and all I had to do is whoop like this on you, are you going to mess with me? No. First time we went into Kibera, the slums in Nairobi, we took two guys, military suits on, Russian-made automatic rifles in their hands, holding them like this to walk us in to the churches we were going to. Did you know, Gary, that nobody messed with us? Why? They knew those guys would shoot and kill them they had, and, legal, and had the legal right to shoot and kill them. They knew that. My point is this. Sin's knocking. Let us in! You're contemplating adultery. You're contemplating alcohol. You're contemplating drugs. You're contemplating lying. You're contemplating... You're thinking about all kinds of sin. And the devils that are provoking you to it are not scared of you. They have no reason to be. And the reason why they're not scared of you is that they've been watching you from a perch, from a ledge, and they know that you haven't touched that thing for three or four days. Or a week. Or two weeks. So they're not afraid of you. Because you're weaponless. Now, you still believe in God. You still have a shield of faith. But remember, that just means they have a right to get close enough to you to hurl fiery darts at you. The way to stop them from hurling the darts to begin with is when they see you standing there with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And when they see that, they'll leave. They'll leave. They will have no choice. They're not stupid. They knew. Listen, you, look, you read the four Gospels. Somebody possessed with devils, the devils knew every time Jesus. Jesus never had to walk up and say, Hi, I'm Jesus, the Son of God. He never had to say that, did He? They said it. What are we to do with thee, thou Jesus, Son of the Most High God? They shouted it for everybody to hear. They knew who He was. And they didn't want Him around. The smart ones even begged Him, Don't throw us into the pit! Throw us into that swine! The swine ran into the pit. Um, what else can I preach to you? Numbers chapter 22, turn there. I better quit. I think God's saying, Mike, shut up. Let me read Joel 3.10 to you. Don't turn to Numbers. Let me read Joel 3 and 10 to you and I'm going to let you go. Joel 3.10. Beat your plowshares into swords. Now what's going to happen during the reign of Christ? The opposite. They're going to beat all the swords into plowshares. Why? Tell me why. Because the devil's locked up in the pit. If there's no enemy, there's no need for swords, right? So during the Christ reign of a thousand years, they're going to take all the swords and beat them into plowshares because there's no need for war, but everybody's got to eat. So they just feed everybody in the whole world. Instead of, instead of making us do it in our church, 
It'll just happen. Amen? But is Jesus reigning in Jerusalem right now? No, because if he were, I guarantee you, they wouldn't be firing rockets at him. He's not reigning right now. So we have the enemies right next to us every single day. So here is, here is your plowshare. This now becomes a sword, a weapon. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. And then watch this. Let the weak say, I am strong. You know who the weak is? Me. When I have no power to stand against my enemies. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. I am weak and I cannot fight any of those. I don't have it. I don't have the ability to do it. I thought at one point, at a certain point in age, I would have the ability to just fight off sin and wouldn't have to worry about it ever again. Those of you who are older than me, has that ever happened to you yet? Do you now not ever want to sin ever? It's still there, isn't it? So as long as you're weak, you need something that will make you strong. And that's a sword. You leave the sword, you're going to fall. You, whoever I'm talking to that's thinking about the adultery, whoever it is, you left the sword. And no wonder that person has been injected into your mind. You stay away from the sword. You're going to fall into sin. And it's going to be just like that first cigarette. It will never be how you thought it was going to be. Amnon lusted after his sister Tamar, David's son. And he visualized time after time after time what it would be like to be with her. And him and his friend worked out a plan to where she would be in the room with him alone. Amnon pretended to be sick. So his sister Tamar brought food into him. And when she got in the room, he grabbed her and he raped her. And what happened immediately after he was done? What happened? He hated her. And cast her from his sight. It never ends up how you think it's going to end up. Never. And without the sword, you have no power against it. Now, I don't know if I'm preaching this to one person or every one of you. I don't know. But if you got sin knocking, it's knocking because they know you don't have a sword. And you're too weak to fight it off. Now let's pray.